All right, guys, so this is, we're getting into chapter 12, um, which is called the health record. And this section is broken up into two lectures as well. So the first lecture uh, in lesson 12.1, chapter 12.1, what we want to talk about is introducing the patient records and the health record in general. So throughout this lesson, we need to be able to define, spell, and pronounce those terms listed in the vocab. We need to name and discuss the two different types of patient records. We need to state several reasons that accurate health records are important and differentiate between subjective and objective information in creating a patient's health record, and then explain who owns that health record as well. We'll also distinguish between um, an EHR and an EMR, and we'll do the following related to legislation and EHRs. We'll explain the AARA, which applies to the healthcare industry. We'll define meaningful use, and then we'll list three components of meaningful use uh, in, in meaningful use legislation. And then we'll explore the advantages, disadvantages, and capabilities of an EHR, an electronic health record system, and explain how to organize a patient's health record. And then, of course, discuss the importance of nonverbal communication with patients, even when an EHR system is used. So let's get started here. So the different types of health records. Now, there are two different types of health records, um, and it can be found in two different formats. There's the electronic format, and then there's the paper format. Um, electronic format has multiple users can use this record at the same time with fewer errors, while the paper method is less efficient and there's good evidence of patient care not nearly as useful um, in other capacities, however, though. Um, so most, most healthcare facilities have switched to go on with the electronic format um, and the federal government has off, also offered financial in, incentives for providers that implement EHRs. So electronic health records are going to be the thing of the now um, and the thing of the future. Um, you're going to see less and less paper uh, medical records in your practice and as you, as you get out into your careers. So it's important for medical assistants, us, to be versatile and, and knowledgeable about both systems because you never know what type of system you're going to be in. So having good knowledge of both and how to use both um, is, is the main goal from leaving here. So now that we know both the different types of health records, uh, we need to talk about the importance of accurate medical records. So medical records help <clears throat> the, the provider provide the best possible care for the patient. Yeah, the provider then enters notes about the patient's examination and any test results into that medical record. And these notes serve as pieces of a jigsaw puzzle to help the provider make an accurate diagnosis and treatment plan for that patient. So it's important for continuity of care with other healthcare professionals because all of this information that you keep updated in your electronic health record or, or your paper medical record, whatever method you use, that, that health record you know, can, travels with that patient forever. So you know, keeping accurate and up-to-date information will help other providers look in and provide care for that patient as well. Um, the medical record provides a complete history of all care given to the patient. So it's not just things that you've done, it's, it's things that everybody has done to help this patient. It can offer legal protection to those who provide care to the patient. An accurate record is the foundation for a legal defense in cases of medical professional liability, whether it's malfeasance, misfeasance, nonfeasance, those type of things. If you have an accurate and up-to-date medical record, it provides great defense for you as um, you know, a, a medical practice. Um, and then it provides statistical information that is helpful to researchers, and it is also vital for financial reimbursement. And the information in the medical record supports claims for reimbursement and is required by most third-party payers so that you can prove that you actually did these procedures and treatments for the patient, that way you can get paid for those as well. So now we've talked about the importance and the different types, let's talk about the contents, things that you're going to find inside of a medical record. Now there's two different parts, or two, two main parts um, that is provided by the patient, okay, and that's subjective information and objective information. Now there's two, different, two differences here. Subjective information is things that the patient tells you. So it could be things like their personal demographics, their name, their age, their date of birth, their address, things like that. Um, and then you can get in, they'll tell you about their past health, their family and social history as well. And then they'll also come in when they wanna visit you and they'll give you a chief complaint. What is really going on? What is bugging the patient? Why are they there to visit you? That is the chief complaint. Now objective information is different. It's things that you can see and observe or, or measure, okay? So you can measure and see vital signs and uh, anthropometric measurements. Uh, you can have findings and laboratory radiology reports would go into this. Diagnosis, diagnosis is what the, the provider tells you is actually going on with you. What is wrong? Um, the treatment prescribed in progress notes are also considered objective information. And then of course the condition at the time of treatment. 
So if all entries are completed, the health record will stand the test of time. It, it's, it'll be accurate, it will hold up um, as a legal defense in court as well. Uh, so patient demographics. Now I talked a little bit about that in the subjective information section, but if you look on page 198 in your book, you'll see this handout here. And this is a, this is a typical uh, patient demographic worksheet, something that they would complete on their first visit there. So this is, like I said, is on page 198, it's figure 12-1, and it provides all the information the medical assistant needs to construct the patient's medical record. Like I said, this will be something that you fill out, or the patient will fill out on their first office visit. Now if you look at page um, 200 in the textbook, at procedure 12-1, you'll see how to create that patient record and register the new patient in the practice management software. So this uh, procedure 12-1 will help get you started with creating that paper medical record and it will also help you get started with entering that patient into an electronic health record. Um, so read over that stuff, guys. Educate yourself um, with that information as well. So then we have the past family and social history. This is still in the subjective information section of that medical record. So the past health history will include um, information about previous, is, previous illnesses and injuries. Okay? And most generally, this information is attained by completing a questionnaire. And that will include information about past illnesses, the daily health habits, and other personal information. So the patient's family history comprises the physical condition of various members of the patient's family, any illnesses or diseases the individual members may have had, and then it's a record of the causes of death as well in the family. The social history includes information about the patient's lifestyle. Do they smoke cigarettes? Do they drink alcohol? Uh, do they use recreational drugs? That type of thing is considered social history, uh, subjective information and social history. Um, and then stickers can be used on the front of the health record to indicate any type of allergies, advanced directives if they have any, and then any other information that um, is, a, is developed by your office policies and procedures manual. And then the last thing in uh, subjective information is going to be your patient's chief complaint. And basically that is a concise account of your patient's symptoms. What are they coming to see you, in, uh, see you with? Why are they there? And it's in the patient's own words. It can be something... Uh, that it could include the nature, location, and frequency, or duration of pain if they have any pain at all, when the patient first noticed these symptoms. Uh, treatments of the patients that the patients may have tried. Maybe they've tried like icing, or ibuprofen, or um, changing their diet, things along those lines. Whether the patient has had the same or similar condition in the past. And then other medical treatments re received for the same um, complaint in the past. So most medical facilities will help use a, a, pain, sis a pain scale to determine the severity of the patient's pain, which we talked about up here. So we've all seen the pain scale before. We've all used the pain scale before. Whenever we went into the hospital, they're on like a, on a pain scale of one to 10, you know, 10 being where you gotta cut your arm off right now, one being it's not bad at all. Um, you know, where would you scale your pain? So that, that's, that is a pain scale and that is considered subjective information because the patient is um, relaying that to you and that is um, part of that right there. So then, so that was a, a subjective findings. Now guys, I can't stress it enough, subjective findings are what the patient presents to you. Why are, they, why are they there? What is going on? What are they telling you? Objective findings and information are things you can see and measure, okay? And like I said, they're findings that can be observed. For things like vital signs and anthropometric, uh, I'm sorry, anthropometric measurements, uh, findings and laboratory radiology reports would go in there, diagnosis, both provisional and differential. Now there is a difference. Provisional diagnosis is a diagnosis where there could be still some doubt that it, it might not be that at all. Okay, so that is a provisional diagnosis. Differential diagnosis is the process of weighing uh, the probability of one disease towards the other. Um, so that is the difference between provisional and uh, differential. Treatments prescribed in progress notes is also um, objective findings as well as condition at the time of the termination of treatment. So, you know, those are all important things to be able to locate and to place in a medical record. So let's talk about our role in medical records. And you know, it, uh, we play a huge role. We deal with these medical records every day, all day. So care must be taken to ensure that the patient's answers are not heard by others. So whenever somebody's discussing with you, whether it's subjective information um, or you're observing objective information, you know, you need to make sure that you, you uh, maintain that confidentiality and those patient rights as well. If the record is ele electronic, the patient may access that record through a patient portal, if you guys have that in your system, or uh, and document the uh, information directly 
into the EHR system. So if you have an electronic system, you guys are gonna be inputting information in daily, all the time, updating after the patient sees the provider. And then the medical assistant may have to document the chief complaint, but the provider will question the patient in more detail and get those, um, the, the important details that you, know, you guys are not trained to find out. So the ownership of that medical record. Now all the information in that medical record pertains to the patient. However, the provider or the medical facility or the maker is the actual owner of that medical record. Now the patient has that right to access that information in the medical record, but they don't have, they don't own the physical record that belongs to the provider or the medical facility. Okay. And like I said, the, the patient, still has the right to demand confidentiality. Even though it is not their medical record, they still have the right because that record contains all the information about themselves, so they have that right to, to, to demand confidentiality. The actual paper health record should never leave the medical facility where it originated. That should stay there all the time. The patient's record should be kept in a locked or locked filing cabinet when the office is closed. That way, if you guys have, um, say, cleaning uh, vendors that come in, or you're doing construction at night, or you guys get broken into, you know, all the patient's health records and, and everything else remains confidential because it is locked away and stored in, the, in a specific spot. And then uh, EHRs, which are electronic health records, eliminate the issue of le legibility in the record because it is all typed up. You don't have to worry about handwriting and understanding what is being written, but it is just as important to be sure that all patient care is documented in the electronic health record health record just because it is online doesn't mean you guys get to take any shortcuts and uh, not document the correct way. So te technologic terms in health information and, and we're going to talk about two main ones here and this is going to be EHR and EMR and we need to know the difference of them. So the EHR which is the electronic health record is, a, is an electronic record of health related information about a patient that conforms to a nationally rec recognized interoperate interoperability standard that can be created, managed, and consulted by authorized clinicians and staff from more than one healthcare facility. That last sentence, that last little part of that sentence is, is the important part. Okay, so the electronic health record can be created, managed, and consulted by authorized clinicians and staff from more than one healthcare facility. Okay, so if you look on the next slide here, you're gonna see what EMR is. Now an electronic medical record is an electronic record of health information about a patient that can be created, managed, and consulted by authorized clinicians and staff within a single healthcare organization. So that is the difference. An EHR is for more than one healthcare facility, and EMR is within a single organization. EMR is being less and less uh, used as federal regul regulations regarding electronic records have been established. Um, they're going more so towards the electronic health record, so that continuity of care between physicians uh, is an easier transition. And then you have a personal health record, which is a PNR, is an electronic form of health-related information about an individual that conforms to na nationally recognized interoperability standards that can be drawn from multiple sources, but is created, managed, that is managed, shared, and controlled by the individual. So HIPAA uses the term PHI, which is protected health information, which is any information about health status, the provision of health care, or the payment for health care that is linked to an individual patient. So that is just another one to be aware of. So let's get into some uh, of the legislation that have, has affected health records and the content of health records. So the, you have the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, which is commonly known as the Economic Stimulus Package, which was signed into law on February 17, 2009 by President Barack Obama. Uh, and it basically, health information technology aspects of the bill provides slightly more than $31 billion for healthcare infrastructure in EHR investment. So basically, that, get, that, that law, okay, that stimulus package, gave $31 billion um, to the healthcare field for any physician and practice and medical practice that invests in and establishes electronic health records at their clinic or practice, and it gives them incentives for reaching those goals. So there, there are certain sections that pertain to healthcare, and they're collectively known as the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act, or in short terms, the High Tech Act, which we'll talk about right now. So the High Tech Act, which we also talked about with computer technology chapter, I believe it was chapter um, eight, if I'm not mistaken. 
So the High Tech Act basically provides financial incentives for meaningful use of a certified EHR technology to achieve health and efficiency goals. So now what do I mean? I mean by meaningful use, okay? Um, what, providers, what do providers gain by meeting the meaningful use requirements? And all that $31 billion, guys, that was set aside for incentives and things like that. That is, so if they get those meaningful use, they're, they're given those incentives, guys. So it was incorporated into the AAA, AARA to promote adoption and meaningful use of health information technology. HIPAA was created partly to simplify administration processes using electronic devices. And, and like I said, guys, meaningful use means providers must show that they are using EHR technology in ways that can be measured significantly, significantly in quantity and quality. All right. And if they can prove that they are getting meaningful use from electronic health records, they are given incentives. Okay. Now there are basically three main components of meaningful use in the clinic. Okay. There's the use of certified EHR in a meaningful manner, in a meaningful manner, such as e-prescribing or electronic prescribing, where instead of writing, having prescription pads and writing prescriptions out, it is now done through the computer. The use of certified electronic health record technology for electronic exchange of health information to improve the quality of healthcare, and then the use of certified EHR technology to submit clin clinical quality reports and other measures. So if they meet those three components of meaningful use, one of those three components of meaningful use, they're eligible for those incentives. Now, there are three, st there are three stages of meaningful use now, and here they are. So in stage, this, so this was kind of how electronic health records were getting established in the medical field and how providers were going through um, the stages of becoming fully electronic health record. Uh, so stage one was about 2011 and 2012, and it basically set a baseline for electronic data and, and information sharing. All right, then in stage two, 2014, we continued to expand on that baseline, and then stage three, which is ex expected to be completed in 2016, um, continue to expand the baseline and further develop through future role making. So guys, it's, it's, a, it's a constantly evolving practice and, and um, tool in the medical office. So being able to adapt to changes and understand the legality of it all is going to be essential as medical assistants. So in subtitle D of the High Tech Act, privacy and security concerns related to the electronic submission of health information are addressed. So if you have any concerns on how to address patients and educate patients, about the security of their health record, um, look at section D of the High Tech Act. And several provisions strengthen the civil and criminal penalties of HIPAA rules. So it's still, regardless of electronic health records, HIPAA is still, you know, and patient security and confidentiality is still a top priority for everybody. Um, so being able to follow HIPAA guidelines, regardless of paper medical records or electronic medical records, is essential. So with the establishment of electronic medical records, you know, you had to modify HIPAA a little bit. So it established it, it, the establishment of categories of violations that reflect increasingly levels of uh, culpability. Okay, so they've changed the laws regarding HIPAAs so that if there's any violation regarding confidentiality, um, you know, their fines will increase. The requirements that penalties be determined based on nature and extent of violation and nature of the extent of harm resulting from violation. So the DHHS determines the penalties on a case-by-case -case basis, and the providers can expect reductions in the amounts that they are paid for Medicare and Medicaid if they are not in compliance with HIPAA. So it's important to know that. And then the establishment of tiers of increasing penalty amounts that determine the range of and the authority to impose civil monetary penalties. So the provider must use a system for tasks at a minimum, such as e-prescribing or computerized physician provider order entry, or CPOE, which kind of goes back to the last slide when we're talking about um, ways that they can use, uh, I'm sorry, the ways that they can use the electronic health record to meet those meaningful use requirements. So if you look on page 203 in your textbook, you're gonna see this figure. And then these are the categories of HIPAA, HIPAA violations and associated penalties. So there's, there's many different penalties and they can range up from like a hundred dollar violation to like one point five million dollar violation. Um, so it's really important to know and follow HIPAA, HIPAA laws and regulations, and provide that customer and patient with the utmost confidentiality. So now there, let's get into the advantages and disadvantages of an electronic health record, guys. 
Now there are a ton and ton of these and it's important to follow along. So according to 2014 survey by the National Ambulatory Medical Survey, 82.8% of providers in office-based practices use full or partial EHR systems. So 83% guys of medical facilities in 2014 were using electronic health records. Okay, that is a huge growth in the last 13 years. It went up 18 per, uh, it went up from 18% to 83%, and now we're a couple of years past 2014, so I'm sure you can see that number is higher as well. But some of the advantages and disadvantages are, uh, the primary reason not all providers have adopted an EHR system is because it is expensive to implement in a practice. It is very expensive to implement. Um, the inability to find an EHR system that meets the practice's needs might be another reason. Okay? Maybe you don't need an extravagant system, or maybe you do need an extravagant system, and you can't find the one that fits your, your, uh, your practice to a T. There could be uns uncertainty about the return on investment. Guys, it is a big capital purchase. There is a lot of money up front that you have to put in place for this, um, so you can have some uncertainty on the return of investment. Is it going to pay off in the future? Um, you can have provider resistance, especially if you are working with an older provider who has done things a certain way for years and years. It could have a loss of productivity or downtime for the installation and learning curve. So when you're installing and trying to learn and train employees about the use of this electronic medical record system, um, you can see that production in the office isn't as high and um, you might have to schedule some more downtime and not pack your schedule so full because everybody is not um, sure of how to use it. But let's look at some advantages now. Let's look at some advantages. Now these are several advantages over, um, these are several advantages over a paper medical record, okay? So electronic medical records reduce medical errors by keeping prescriptions, allergies, and information organized. It reduced the cost by preventing duplicate tests. It reduced staffing because uh, fewer personnel are needed. It's more legible than handwritten documents. It's more secure by requiring usernames and passwords not just pulling in or walking into a records closet and pulling it. Um, it requires much less stored space than paper files. A computer nowadays is much smaller than a records room. Information be can be assessed from multiple locations simultaneously at the same time. Patient database allows statistical information to be recalled. And then patient information is available quickly in an emergency regardless of its location. And then it's possible for uh, more patients to be seen in a day once you are familiar with that system. Um, so here are some disadvantages. It can lack capital investment in its adoption. So the financial and non-financial costs of implement, uh, implementing electronic health records in primary care practices was an article in the online journal of health affairs. And it suggests that the startup cost for a five provider practice is approximately $162,000 with 85,000 of that going towards maintenance and cost during the first year. So it is expensive. It is very expensive to get established. $162,000 on average to, to get this up and running. So with that, you might have reluctance. Uh, so you might not be able to invest in it because the provider doesn't want to put out that much money. All right, You could have a reluctance from employee, employees to learn a new system. The patients may fear that their records will be posted on the internet since it is electronic. Um, the training is time consuming and costly. So both the provider and the staff require extensive training in the EHR system and must be receptive to even more training to use the, uh, to use the, the system to its full capacity. So that is, it is time consuming guys. And then healthcare facilities use different terms and abbreviations which can lead to confusion. So it's important um, to be able to understand exactly what is being written in there. And then choosing a user friendly system with good customer support is also key. Um, but it's not necessarily a disadvantage. So a lot of medical records are dealing, or a lot of medical practices are dealing with the conversion from paper medical records to electronic health records. Um, so these tips, uh, use these tips for successful conversion between a paper medical record and an EHR system. So it's important to get the entire facility on board with the change. You know, let them know why the change is coming and why it's important. Provide leadership to the staff, encourage and, and praise staff's hard work, 
in making the conversion successful. And then as a medical assistant, be loyal and promote loyalty to the facility during the change. It might cause uneasiness, it might cause unrest, okay? but it's important to notice that this is your job is to care for the patient and this option will give you the best patient-focused care. Um, you can use good people management skills, especially with those who are against the conversion. Many people who are initially adverse to conversions later say they don't know how they ever worked without the EHR. Always give your patients, visitors, and coworkers excellent customer service. Just because you're working on a computer doesn't mean you, you can't provide great customer service. Work as a team with other staff members. Use employees' strong qualities where they are needed. Um, and be willing to venture into a new system and keep that positive attitude, guys. And remember that if, that if medicine is anything, it is a constant change. It's always changing. In the medical field, there's always research going on, guys. There's always new information coming out, new treatments, new technology. So it's ever-changing. You guys in the medical field have to be able to adapt to those changes um, and take it in stride. So now there's many different capabilities of an EHR. So we'll talk about what it can do now. So the EHR system, it's also called um, the practice management system, can perform multiple tasks, saving time and money in the provider's office. You can have specialty software, which can tailor terminology and patient care to, to a provider's specialty. If they're a podiatrist or an orthodontist or something along those lines, you know, getting one that fits that specialty would be beneficial. You could have something easier just as an appointment scheduler, which is the ease, it just helps easing of scheduling you know, it puts it on every single computer station that has that electronic health record. And you can, uh, like I said earlier, you can reach that from any computer simultaneously, regardless of who's on there. Uh, it can work as an appointment reminder and confirmation, and it can also send out automated calls to patients. And then it's a prescription writer. So this produces the electronic prescriptions uh, for printing submission or just to email for the pharmacy. Okay. And if you look on page 207 in your book on a procedure 12-2, It'll describe how to upload documents that were paper into um, the electronic system. You can have medical billing systems, which basically just manage and it manages all billing and accounting information. And then you can have charge captures, which store billing codes to help maximize profit, profits and alerts for mistakes. So if you look at an evaluation and management codes that are used during office visits to obtain the highest possible reimbursement, um, oops, sorry about that, guys. Okay, so uh, e evaluation and management codes are used during office visits to obtain the highest possible reimbursement, um, and these help the provider maximize the profit while remaining in compliance with the law. And then you have eligibility verification, and basically this just pre-authorize um, insurance eligibility online instead of making that phone call. And then, of course, referral management, it coordinates and shares information between current and referring providers. And then if you have, um, it can also do laboratory and order integration. And basically that allows interactions with outside laboratories to order tests and check results, things like that. Um, tests can be ordered from the provider's laptop, their tablet or smartphone. And the results can be transmitted via scan, scax, fax, fax, scan or email and uploaded directly to that patient's medical record. And then uh, many, Electronic health records now have a patient portal, which allows patients to access their medical records, set up appointments, view, review statements, and complete a new uh, and, and complete new patient records. Things along those lines, guys. Uh, and then we're gonna finish up here, talking about nonverbal communication with the patient while using EHR. Um, just because you're standing behind a computer all day and working with um, that's that aspect. You still need to be able to communicate with patients. So patients are consumers of healthcare services and they expect quality. Uh, so, it's imp uh, so the patient may decide to change providers simply because he or she does not feel comfortable with a particular provider. And when using the EHR, make sure nonverbal communication sends the right message to the patient. Just because you're working behind a computer, you still have to connect with them and, and reassure them that, that they are the focus of the, the practice, not their medical records. Um, so use eye contact with you when using their EHRs. Um, allow the screen to be imbued so that they feel that they're a part of the process and then position yourself next to or at an angle to your patient to encourage a partnership. That way they are feeling like they are a part of this and you're not just filling in paperwork for them. And then, um, you know, a patient deserves to, 
patients deserve to choose most aspects of their health plans. Uh, and when you do make them choose, don't expect to make them to make quick decisions. It is regarding their health, so it could be a big decision for them. And then follow up and make note of any wait time, uh, patient's request, and enter it into the EHR. So make sure timely communication is kept with the patient and that any additional orders that need to be put in place are completed. Um, and then make sure that the patient understands all instructions and test procedures in preparation for those procedures. So most EHRs now can print an instruction sheet which you can review with the patient to help them you know, hold up to their end and be more educated about that. And then the, the, the customer aspect of patient care is even more important when the facility uses an EHR because you are taking um, a little bit of that verbal communication um, out when you are, you are mainly doing online. So it's important guys that just because you're using computers a ton, you still have great customer service. All right, and that's gonna end today's lesson on the health record. Um, next lecture, guys, we'll continue on with that, but let's get chapter 12.1 uh, assignment, critical thinking done before we move on to that. You know, keep up the hard work and have fun, guys.